as soon as plastic goes into the river, you might catch 80% if you put a river barrier in place. If it goes into the ocean, plastic also sinks. Yeah, So we have a lot of plastic that goes to the bottom of the ocean, which will never be recovered. And then there's a bit that swims at the surface and pulling that out of the ocean is close to impossible. Welcome to Tech Talks, hosted by myself, David Savage, and powered by Nash Squared. On today's show, we are talking to Joel Tash, the founder of Clean Hub. Um, look, we know there's a climate crisis going on, but what can we do about it? I'm going to be talking all about plastic and the oceans. But before that, good good afternoon. I was about to say good morning. It's mm. ten past four. What am I on about? <laughs> good afternoon, Akish. Hello, Mr. Savage. Oh, How that, are you? That tells you exactly what kind of day I've had. Yeah, I'm, I saying, oh, I'm all over the show. Also, we're, we're recording our uh, later in the week episodes. Oh, the, Friday the Friday, episodes. the Friday special. The new Friday show. The Friday night takeaway, if you listen to it on Friday night. We're recording this in person now, so hopefully the chemistry is a bit better between us. Was the chemistry not good? No, I'm not saying it's not good. <laughs> but I mean, in person, you know, it's a bit is this, more... Is this the first pod spat? Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I think we've gone past that. Uh, no, I think it's a bit more, uh, you know, we are... Yeah, hopefully coming to you live in person. In sync. Hopefully they can feel it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just very quickly, I, I spotted this this afternoon when I was on The Guardian uh, at lunchtime. Steve Jobs wrote a $4 check in 1976. It's been auctioned off for $36,000. And I was just wondering, have you ever written anything that you think is depreciated or appreciated in value? I think, I think any check I've ever written has probably gone down in value rather than up in value. Oh, I mean, I'll be honest. I have written checks, but yeah, so... It was, I think the last time I wrote a check was about... 10, 12 years ago, maybe? maybe something like that. I think I might have written a cheque or two in my life. I mean, more, more of my interactions with cheques were getting cheques in the post yes. from my grandma. Yeah. Like, oh, great. Here's yeah. some money for your birthday that you can't now access for yeah, about yeah, two yeah. weeks. Because yeah. you've got to find the time to get down the bank. That's it. And then it takes them God knows how long to process the money thing. HMRC, I've, I've received a few cheques from there. Oh, uh, have you? Yeah. Not, not anymore, though. Um, back in the day. Uh, but yeah, it's just, yeah, cheques are... Uh, Mm, there are there are you know an art that's not in fashion anymore, is it? Oh, I don't know. Even sure I'd describe them as an art. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Less paper waste. Less paper waste. Correct. Who needs a checkbook? No one. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. By the way, as well, uh, a pair of his Birkenstocks. I get this right. A pair of early Steve Job Birkenstock sandals. Yeah. Sold for two hundred and eighteen thousand dollars. That's ridiculous. Two hundred eighty thousand dollars. That's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Because Birkenstocks, I mean, yeah, they're, they're a bit... They're smelly. F- but also they're fashionable at the moment, right? Are they? Yeah, it, they are. They were. Yeah. They're fashionable at the moment, especially with the, all the new mule kind of designs. But, um, yeah, 218 grand on his shoes. Like, People have more money than sense. I mean, yeah. You know, he's... Uh, I'm sure he's very pleased uh, looking down. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, look, we said we said um, less printing of checkbooks, which mm-hmm. is good for the environment. It's a, it's a very random, nice segue into today's interview yeah. where we're talking to Joel uh, from Clean Hub. So I'll hand over to the interview. We'll be back afterwards. Today I'm talking to Joel, someone I was lucky enough to meet at IFA in Berlin, maybe a month ago, I, I suppose now. You shared the stage with me. I, I moderated a, a chat that you were having um, on the sustainability stage. So it's lovely to see you again. Yeah, likewise. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, clearly that fireside didn't go too badly, the fact that you're sat here. So. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great um, discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Look, uh, you are uh, from Clean Hub. Before we get into anything else, do you just want to describe a little bit about what CleanHub does? Yeah, with CleanHub um, is what we call a waste management platform. And we believe it needs to be a platform because there's so many stakeholders in that topic. And we have one goal with that platform, and that is what we call to reverse plastic pollution. And what does that mean? It means that we have to collect more plastic than what is being produced. This is obviously a massive goal. And if we achieve that, that would be fantastic. But if you look closer at it, what what needs to be done for that, it's quite evident. If we say we need to collect more than what we produce, there's two levers. A, 
how much plastic is being collected, but on the other side also how much plastic is being produced. And we try to help companies reduce the amount of plastic that they use and at the same time build out waste management infrastructure um, where there is none, mostly in the global south. We're currently active in India, Indonesia, Cambodia and Tanzania, where with the help of um, companies we are paying for waste management and waste collection services so that less trash ends up in the environment, ends up in the ocean. And these are the two core topics that we work on. And in particular, the oceans. I mean, if you, if you go on your LinkedIn, for example, Clean Hub yeah. for Clean Oceans, yeah. why, why that focus on oceans in particular? Um, that's mostly me. Um, I started the company and I love the oceans. I um, grew up at Lake Constance in southern Germany. So I've always been sailing and later started surfing. And I have a deep passion for the ocean and I would lie if I would say that I had the same deep passion for waste management growing up like I have for water sports and being outside and for me this is where everything started and um, in the end I'm carrying my personal why into the company and into into the brand also that we're building around it and I started the company because I was annoyed with plastic in the oceans and from there worked my way backwards to find a way how we can actually reduce the the amount of trash that goes into the oceans. So it's, in the end, a very egoistic standpoint. But There seems to be a rising acceptance in... I've got to be really careful here because I, I, don't, I don't want to sound like certain parts of the world are preachy and, and whatever. Yeah. I, it, so, so forgive me if I get this wrong. But certainly here in the UK, and I think throughout Europe, you're seeing less and less single-use plastics. Mm. Um, I mean, obviously they still still exist, but the amount of places now where it's kind of um, cardboard or chipboard or not cardboard, but wooden um, cutlery, mm. rather not cardboard, uh, wooden cutlery. Uh, but then I travel to the States, say, a country which I kind of would expect to be on the same wavelength. And there's single use plastics everywhere in mm. the southern states in particular that I've visited. What's, what's the kind of the global picture with regards to plastics? Be, because I would have thought that people were kind of on the same page and know that this is bad? No. Um, I think that the good thing about plastic pollution and plastic in general is that there's very, very few deniers like we have in the climate space because plastic pollution itself is so visible, right? But at the same time, the relation to plastic is quite different depending on where you go. So I also remember when, when I went to the States, when I went to even places like San Francisco, right? You go into a restaurant, even if it's like a small imbiss, but you dine in, you eat there, and you get your food served on plastic tables or plastic um, plastic plates, styrofoam boxes, so you get your pancakes and eat it out of styrofoam, which was quite surprising to me as well. At the same time, the per capita use of, of um, plastic is still the highest, where GDP is also the highest. Um, so places like the US, the UK, Germany, we still consume by far the most plastic. The thing is, we have waste management infrastructure. We have um, people that collect the trash and that take care of that trash. What we now see is that, fortunately, prosperity in other parts of the world is also rising. So people start to consume more. Well, this is now debatable <laughs> if that's a good thing or not, but... Um, I'm happy for them that they get to live a similar lifestyle. So they start to buy plastic. The thing is, there's 2 billion households specifically in that area, or sorry, 2 billion consumers specifically in that area that don't have waste management. So there's no bin in the backyard where they can put the trash and somebody comes to pick it up. So what happens? They buy the plastic, it goes into the environment, it goes into the rivers, it goes into the ocean, and... Um, this is obviously a problem, right? And we've seen that in Europe just recently. In Paris, the waste workers went on strike. I think this year the city looked insane within a week because nobody was picking up the trash. Same happened in, in Elmro. Um, the waste workers also stopped working, went on strike, and the trash was just piling up on the streets and there was pollution everywhere. So, yeah, consumption is one topic. The management of it is another now, if I have a look at kind of how you, you as a business are, are, are trying to 
find a solution for this. Mm-hmm. You don't think it's necessarily about recovering plastic once it's already used in nature. You you very much think it's about stopping it from getting there in the first place and tackling yeah. that root cause. Yeah. When it is so prevalent, how do you go about that? And I'm not saying that obviously <laughs> you shouldn't be trying, but yeah. you are you are facing a mountain. It's difficult to know where to begin, right? Yeah, and in the end, I think uh, what what helps is a is a principled approach in that case. So um, we say with every household that we connect to waste management, there will be less pollution that goes into the environment. So we're kind of following the path from the plastic in the ocean back to the household and even back to the producer. Yeah, these are in my eyes the two core areas where solutions need to focus on because only if we get producers to actually produce less plastic there will be less waste and only if we get households to keep the trash controlled in one place in one bag and don't litter it um, then we actually have a chance to to get a grip on the problem because as soon as plastic goes into the river you might catch 80 percent if you put a river barrier in place if it goes into the ocean Plastic also sinks, yeah? So we have a lot of plastic that goes to the bottom of the ocean, which will never be recovered. And then there's a bit that swims at the surface and pulling that out of the ocean is close to impossible. So we looked at that problem and said, okay, how can we actually build a solution that is scalable, that goes beyond cleaning up the beach at a time and then the next day it looks the same way again. And um, this is where we said, okay, this needs to be, yeah, as I said, scalable. So it needs to be a platform where local entrepreneurs in the areas where they live can start a waste management business to collect the trash from the households directly. Um, this is not just operationally scalable, but also financially scalable, yeah? because it's the cheapest way to, to actually get trash. Because as soon as it's on the beach, if you follow us on Instagram or TikTok, you can see it. We, we did a video. One of the wrappers weighs 1.5 gram. Now imagine how long you have to walk around and pick up trash to get to one metric ton of plastic waste, where if it is contained in one spot, um, there's way less working time that goes into keeping the environment cleaner. Whilst I don't disagree with any of that, yeah. Um, yeah. And, I, and I really hope that others buy into the idea, no. I think that my experience so i i am very lucky to have been on some nice holidays and i have yeah. seen how shocking plastic looks in a location where you don't expect it not that it should mm. look normal anywhere but you kind of get my point mm. how alive are the investment communities to this problem when you go and start talking to them about plastic and removing plastic to beaches mm. do they see the the return on investment do they kind of understand the challenges or do they, do they maybe understand but question whether or not there's there's money to be made for them mm. are we talking about like institutional investors or are we talking about companies that pay for the waste collection i'm talking about institutional investors initially but if mm. you want to expand it out to talk talk more broadly then absolutely do that it's, it's just mm. interesting to know what the appetite i suppose is from business to support schemes like these Mm-hmm. So the, the appetite from, from businesses to support these schemes um, is very much dependent on who owns that business. Uh, the majority of our customer base are people that, in my eyes, are good citizens. It's mostly founder and owner-led organizations. And the bigger ones that are publicly owned or, or publicly traded, they are feeling the pressure from the regulator. Because these countries also don't want to to sit there and see how their countries are being turned into like a, a massive landfill in the end, yeah. And this, in the end, is then also what attracts the institutional investor community because you know waste management is is not a horrible industry um, to to invest in. If you look at the the big waste management companies that are out there. Waste Management Inc. in the U.S. has a market cap of $90, $90 billion. If you look at the German company Remondes, which is mostly family-owned, uh, I think family Redmann lives a pretty good life. Um, if you look at Alba, a German waste management company, they're also doing quite well. Um, also Veolia, these are big companies. Um, 
because this is a service that the entire society needs in the end. And what I find particularly interesting is the overall move towards a more circular economy because, and this is now going a bit into detail, so stop me if it gets too technical, but um, what everybody's talking about is obviously climate, carbon emissions, and so far the focus has very much been on scope one and two, and more and more people are talking about scope three emissions, so what happens in the supply chains themselves, yeah? And the major contributor there is the fact that you constantly have to buy new raw materials that come from drilling for oil, they come from mining, they come from heavy industry. And um, the only way how you can really get that down is if you learn how to reuse waste as a raw material. Um, and building out access to waste, turning that back into raw material, this is, I think, the, the, the big, big opportunity because then suddenly you're not a waste management company anymore, but you're a modern mining company, like you're competing with the BPs of the world, with the shells of the world. Um, and this is now the optimistic founder in me speaking. Yeah? But in the end, uh, this is where we want to get. So we want to not just collect the waste, but then also more and more look into ways of how can we actually then also monetize that waste, turn it back into raw materials and feed it back into the industry. <clears throat> Let me ask a question then that... Yeah. Um... Don't know, it might not be particularly elegant, but you talked about feeling the pressure from regulators being something that is changing the behavior of big companies. You also mentioned that some of the founders that you're talking about, they are good citizens yeah. and that there is that pressure there. With regards to changing habits and mm -hmm. processes, what is more effective? Because it would seem to me that one of these could potentially lead to, well, both might lead to greenwashing rather than real action. So when we're, when we're looking for real change, is pressure mm -hmm. from regulators or pressure from consumers more effective? I think pressure from consumers. Because yeah. in the end, <clears throat> if you look at the, the companies that are responsible for plastic pollution, it is mostly consumer packaged goods. Um, and... As long as the consumer is not demanding change, why should they change their, their business model, right? If, if everything is going well... Even if the regulators should... are telling them that they have to. I mean, you have, in, in some places in the world, you have laws in place that enforce companies to pay for the waste that they produce, but they just ignore it. Like, these laws are not necessarily then enforced. But what changes is if, and this is actually what we are building a lot of our hope on, if we show to the world and also to consumers, look, there are two ways of doing business. One is the, the conscious way where you say, okay, I understand as a business, I have externalities. Every business has these. There's not a single business that is producing anything that does not have externalities, meaning a negative impact on the environment. But I can take responsibility for that and try to reduce that to an absolute minimum. And then as a consumer, you should rather buy from these brands that are putting the work into that and that are taking responsibility for that because these are the businesses that will thrive tomorrow and stop buying from those that don't do it anymore. Because what would happen if one of the big ones lose 1% market share, right? They would start thinking about, okay, what's going on? Why is everybody moving towards these smaller, more responsible brands? And um, that's in the end the, the big trend that we are hoping for and well in the end it is a consumer solution right in the end we want to make it easy for for consumers to spot the brands that are taking responsibility um and distinguish them from those that don't because just to to give you one concrete example we well, i was just in a in a small fisher village in um, indonesia and the people there if it's a lot they live on 150 dollars a month that's their, that's their household income. And the big FMCGs, the big companies that produce detergent, shampoo, whatever, they managed to find a consumer group within there with single-serve units, and they wrap their stuff in horrible multi-layer packaging that cannot even be recycled in single-serve units. They profit from that. They are the ones that get money for, for putting that trash there, but nobody's enforcing them to take responsibility for that waste, right? And um, that needs to change. If 
the company needs to pay for the collection of the of the waste that they put out there before it goes on the market, then we will see an actual change on, on plastic pollution. Look, I think it's a really important message to get out there. Thank you for taking the yeah. time to talk to me today. And yeah, good absolutely. luck with your mission. I think uh, a lot of people will realize that it's an incredibly important one. Yeah, thank you so much. Just out of interest, Keith, before we um, change on to our, onto our voice note of the week from a listener, mm -hmm. um, have you ever been on holiday and, and unfortunately been confronted with a load of plastic? I have, yeah. It's pretty shocking. It's, it's actually, it's a lot more, when you think about it and you live in a, in a city like we do and work, we're, at the moment we're in, you know, we're sat in the middle of the city of London and yeah. yes, there is rubbish and things like that. You'll Absolutely. see on the streets and, yeah. you know, that sort of thing and it's Christmas time, whatever. But when you actually see huge amounts of, you know, just like just plastic bottles, mm -hmm. bags, things like that, that have just been left. Um, it's actually a lot more scarier. Like, it's not even a case of, oh, that's dirty and oh, I don't really like how that looks. It's actually a bit like, wow, like, what is the world coming to almost? Like, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, I mean, maybe your point's really good because, like, I always think, oh, you know, when I was in that really exotic, picturesque location and then I saw rubbish and it was really jarring and mm. how could anyone litter here? Mm. But actually, how could anyone litter full stop? And, mm. and not even just that, just the, 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 the amount of um, plastic that is, that is created. Mm. Like, mm. it's the fact that it's everywhere and litter, you know, you see... You see plastic bottles just thrown by the sides of yeah. the road and yeah. people who are obviously too lazy to put stuff in the bin when they yeah. need to drive through McDonald's or whatever else. Yeah. And it is just, it's disgusting and it it's is. terrible. It is. And also the, the places where I've seen it, um, you know, where I've seen it quite a lot actually is, is, um, um, is back home in Pakistan when I went back and, and Pakistan actually has a coastline and, and quite a picturesque coastline actually. Mm. But the people that go to the beach and stuff, like families there for a day, They'll take, you know, food, drinks, um, that sort of stuff. But then there is just no concept of clearing up after themselves. Yeah. So they will go to the beach, they will do all these things, and they will just leave everything. Yeah. And, and I remember uh, waking up, like, on, on a morning and kind of, um, you know, my, um, my cousin there was like, oh, you know, um, we'll go out and get some breakfast. And as, as we were driving down the coastline, like, you can just see... You can see the sand, you can see the water, and you can just see bubbles off just mess and plastic. And I was like, all that's going to happen is when the tide comes in, that's all going to go back into the water. Yeah, washed out. Yeah. And I was like, that is actually horrendous. Yeah. And as Joel says in the interview, I think I get this right, he says 80% of it sinks. Yeah. So we only see a fraction of what's floating on the surface exactly. at, at that point. The, the, the amount of damage it's doing. Yeah, exactly that. And it's just... Um, you know, a lot of the times we hear about, you know, preserving the environment and sustainability and things like that. And everyone, you know, it's emissions, 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 right? And it, that's quite a popular thing. But it's also, you know, our, our plastic waste, our, our, yeah. our, you know, our sort of human um, behaviours to change things can, yeah. can help a hell of a lot. Joel, thanks for being our guest. We're going to spend a few minutes at the end of the show talking about our voice note of the week. As, as hopefully people are aware now, Friday's show, we're encouraging listeners to send in a voice note with a tech story or something they think tech, tech founders should be talking about. Yep. Sarah from Follow and Heard has, has radioed in with this. Hello, I'm Sarah, uh, the founder of Follow and Heard. Here's a story that I think a lot of tech founders need to hear and that's their own. Your innovations are reshaping the industry and pushing boundaries of what's possible. But I feel a lot of tech leaders are missing one really important factor, and that's actually telling their own story. Um, your technology might be awe-inspiring, but without that right marketing strategy, it's like a book that's just basically waiting to be read, a masterpiece waiting to be unveiled. So here's the secret. Your brand isn't just the technology. It's the story behind it. It's your story. It's the narrative that connects your innovations to the world, makes them relatable, and most importantly, makes them memorable. I work with a lot of tech leaders, and one of the biggest things that I'm seeing is they don't know how to tell their own story. 
they're excited about the technology, they're excited about the problems that they're solving, but they're missing something which is so vital and it's the passion, it's the narrative, it's their own story behind it, it's their why. So pushing that and pushing um, content that's about and relevant to them as well as their technology they're building is super important. Would, would you count yourself as a storyteller? You're a salesperson, you've got yeah, a good storyteller. Yeah, I'd, I'd say I tell a good story. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'd tell a good story. Don't tell me to tell one now. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I, I, I totally, I love the sentiment that Sarah's coming out from this because I think, I think whether you're, you know, a founder or anyone who's working realistically in, in, mm. in any kind of form of, of work, mm. actually being able to tell a story is a really strong skill set to have. Mm. Um, and I found an article in Forbes about storytelling tips um, for founders from the science of storytelling by Will Storr. And I think Will Storr is someone who's written kind of for, for fiction writers, for students who are writing yeah. literature. Um, but a lot of those messages um, really apply to, um, to, to, to founders as well. So I'll put a link in the show notes because there's a few different sections, but there was one in particular that jumped out at me, which is that you're not the hero of your story. Mm. And that's hard for founders. Right? Yeah, because that they're... is very hard. Because a lot of the time, the founder or the main person in charge is the one that's associated with the technology yeah. or the product. I mean, look at um, look at our friend, Mr. Sam Altman. Right, mm. it was all about him. It was all about him. Right, a few weeks ago, and you know this and that and and whatever happened. But I think that's massive. Right, like in terms of you know, you almost want to you almost want to try to be normal and, and, and reveal the story of the business or the vision or, yeah. or, you know, and not just you because, yeah, it's not always about you. Yeah, but Will, Will Storr points out in his book yeah. that everyone who's psychologically normal thinks they're the hero, which makes sense. We're yeah. all, like, the main character in yeah. our lives. Yeah, yeah. So, therefore, if your business is your business mm. it's not like the business you work for it's the business you created mm. by extension it, it 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 probably stands to reason that you're gonna make that about you mm. but basically the, the the point of this is that it's really important you try and put yourself in the shoes of others because it's it's a really important skill to be able to build a product that people need um it's about convincing them and influencing them that that this is something that is really mm. relevant and important to them, which actually is the art of sales. Yeah, absolutely, and, and it's about it's about showing the impact that you have, and I think it's written in the article. But like, show the impact that you're having, and yeah. you know, rather than just uh, you know, I am uh, I don't know Steve Jobs. You know, we talked about him earlier on, and I've set up this and I've set up that, and you know my four dollar checks are now going for whatever thousands of do you know what i mean it's just yeah be a bit human about it because i do think that we have plenty of founders uh that have come on on this podcast and you know me and you sometimes sit there and we don't just buy into them as a person but we buy into the story and the vision and, and well i think i think what the reason, successful right? founders are good at is telling you how what they're doing is solving a problem yeah. solving someone else's problem yeah. impacting yeah on someone else's life, life yeah. rather than theirs. And I think Steve Jobs, you know, one of the yeah. things that he was brilliant at was telling people why his products would improve their lives. Mm. You know, um, people fell in love with, with Apple products yeah. because he, they felt it, it, it changed the way that they were able to access yeah. stuff. Yeah. Like, realistically, I think the iPod was not revolutionary, but mm. iTunes and yeah. that platform and the ability for people to yeah. have a music library with them and experience yeah. their life with music yeah. is... To, to think that that's not something that we had like 20 years ago Correct. is kind of mad. Correct. And also to think that... Uh, I think... I mean, we're going to talk about Steve Jobs, but when you talk about him, you talk about the Apple, the Mac, the iPod, the you know iPhone, whatever, right? Mm. But you don't talk about iTunes, right? And Which is... You know, before Daniel Ek and Spotify and all these other places, yeah. that was that was the number one hub, right? And, yeah. and that was where every artist, music, whatever, movies were were, were were sort of put on. And you know, he had a massive hand. But in the same way, 
a favourite of the show and a favourite of yours, um, Tessa Clark. Like you mm-hmm. buy into not necessarily her story, but you buy into Olio and what they're doing and how it was set up to help, you know, with the food wasted type oh, yeah. of people. She's, and she's brilliant storytelling. Yeah. So I think that sort of stuff is fantastic because yeah. for me, if I'm reading on her story and obviously, you know, heard her, seen her interviews and that sort of thing and friend of the pod, I think that is what you uh, want to hear. But I, but I, lo- I love the voice because it said, you know, sometimes your business can be a book waiting to be read and a masterpiece waiting to be unveiled. Unveiled? Mm-hmm. Unveiled. Um, yeah, and if you're not doing it correctly and not telling the right stories and marketing it, then unfortunately you'll probably be pushed to the back of the library. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, look, what, what I'm going to do now is do a shout out. If you're listening, if you're still listening by that point, somebody must do. Yeah. Because apparently we're the, one of the top two percent most listened to shows in the world. So some people <laughs> must make it through to the yeah. end. Yeah. Um, their phone's in the bottom of their bag and they can't be bothered to change it. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Here we are. Message <laughs> us. I'm going to change the Q&A on Spotify. Oh. Um, so if you're listening on Spotify, um, tell us about a really good example of a business that you think tells their story well, and we'll check out if anyone gets back to us. Very good. Fingers crossed. Eh? Hilo, another friend of the pod. Hilo. They do, they tell good a very story. good story. They tell very a good, good story. story. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. we go. So, Sustainability trainers, if anyone's correct. interested. There yeah, 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 yeah. So, very good story, and uh, yeah. Let's see, if, let's see if we can find another. We're going to be back on Monday with a show about how not to be a dick. Brilliant. Do you want me on there or? Oh, always. <laughs> Get some tips for both of us. Might struggle with that one, but uh, we shall see. <laughs> Tech Talks is hosted and edited by David Savage. It is produced by Nash Squared. And we have special thanks to Lemzy for supplying music to this show.